Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we heard from Bill on our changing workforce and its impact on workers' compensation. Today's final session will reveal which of these potential game changers could impact workers' compensation in the next 15 years. To walk us through a realistic assessment, please welcome to the stage, Sean Cooper and Raji Chatteravian. So like Bill, I also have a daughter that just graduated from college. And uh, let me just say, I know she's not off the payroll. <laughs> but it also got me thinking about, you know, how different the world is now versus when I graduated from college. The world has certainly changed and is now changing even more rapidly. Where we live, what we drive, how we communicate, what we dream of. Do we really have to be sitting behind the desk to be working or traveling along the highway, the busy 95 freeway? Yeah, I as much as I hate traffic, it probably wouldn't bother me much if I had an autonomous vehicle to drive me around. So first off, I wanna thank all of you that responded to our polling. And as we go through a few of the potential game changers, uh, we will sprinkle it through and share the poll results as we go through. Now, our first poll result is about autonomous vehicles. And our survey says, 47% of the respondents feel that autonomous vehicles could be a game changer for work comp. Yes, and one thing's for certain, Sean. The automobile technology has come a long way since the 1800s. Some of the major safety features that were developed over the years include, well, in the 1920s, we saw safety glass. Come the 1940s, we saw directional signaling. And the 1960s brought safety features like energy absorbing steering wheels, padding on the instrument panels, and hydraulic brakes. Now, in the 1980s, we saw the advent of a interesting Porsche that just did not look like the Porsches. It was the 924 model. On a more serious note, uh, we also saw uh, the anti-lock brakes make their appearance. And legislation was also important to implement the safety features that technology brought our way. Most notably, seatbelt laws were introduced in virtually every state between the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s. And if we fast forward to 2008, another significant safety feature was tire pressure monitoring systems. And more recently, we've seen a whole slew of features, like adaptive headlights and collision warning with auto brakes. And here we are today, wondering whether with the autonomous vehicles, we have to drive at all, right? right. We could be going places. Well, NCCI data re reveals that from occupations that involve driving, we get 50% of total premium and approximately 25% of payroll. That includes trucking class codes, as well as occupations that drive occasionally, like salespeople. Now, last year, our colleagues shared some interesting results regarding motor vehicle accident experience in workers' compensation. Unlike the overall workers' comp claim frequency, the frequency of claims for motor vehicle accidents has actually been increasing in recent years. They also found that two out of five fatalities were due to crashes, and 20% of permanent total claims, the most serious claims in workers' compensation, were due to motor vehicle accidents. Now, the average claim cost for a motor vehicle accident, or an MVA, is three times the cost of other claims. This makes up almost 10% of workers' compensation system costs. And the study also showed a striking similarity between the growth and popularity of cell phones, particularly smartphones over that same time period, mm -hmm. suggesting that distracted driving may be a factor. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration asserts that 90% of accidents are caused by driver error. And a published study by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety shows that vehicles equipped with forward collision warning with auto brake 
is 56% less likely to be involved in crashes with injury. So using that as a proxy for the AVs, we find the potential reduction in motor vehicle accidents, uh, injuries in workers' compensation. Now, some industry observers doubt that we'll see autonomous vehicles uh, on a widespread uh, level within the next 15 years. I'm saying it really doesn't matter. The safety features will be the game changer whether or not the cars are self-driving. And since motor vehicle accident claims are more costly on average, a decline in MVA frequency would also result in lower overall severity. More specifically, if we assume a 20% reduction in motor vehicle accidents, that would yield a 2% savings on work comp system costs. A 50% drop would reap more than 5% in savings. And if you believe a 75% frequency reduction is possible, we could see as much as an 8% savings on work comp system costs. And that's just the national perspective. Now, the shares of motor vehicle accident costs vary across states. A 50% reduction in motor vehicle accident frequency could result in lower workers' compensation costs by as little as 3% in Vermont or 9% in Oklahoma. Certainly some meaningful changes. Indeed. So the wheels of change continue to provide opportunities for a safer workplace, but the workplace itself and the nature of work is also changing, as Dr. Howard just shared with us. For the gig economy, we also asked uh, for your opinions, and let's go ahead and show the results. 36% of respondents feel that the gig economy is a potential game changer. Well, Raji and I, we are in the 64% side on this one. <laughs> we really don't think it's a game changer, but we wanted to discuss it today because we hear a lot of buzz about this topic. First of all, when we refer to the gig economy here, we mean a labor market where short-term contracts dominate and workers aren't tied to a single company. The term is commonly used with companies like Uber and Lyft, but more importantly, is touted as transforming the traditional employer-employee relationship. Agreed. In traditional employment, a worker's schedule is dictated by his employer. But for the gig economy, the worker is in control of his own schedule. He could walk dogs on Mondays, deliver food on Tuesday. The possibilities are endless. And the major draw of the gig economy is this flexibility. I like that. Now, on the other hand, a key difference as well is compensation. In traditional employment, a single employer pays its workers in the form of wages and salaries and some benefits, maybe health insurance benefits, while in the gig economy, workers are typically paid a flat fee for each gig. So since gig workers have largely been categorized as non-employees or contractors, they don't get employee benefits, including work comp. So in theory, a large shift away from traditional employment towards gig work could significantly reduce work comp exposure volume. If there's a shift, there is. If. Now, even measuring the, gig, the size of the gig economy is not straightforward, partly because there is not a consistent definition that's being used. That's true. The Federal Reserve did a survey where they considered a wide variety of activities as gig work, including babysitting and helping people move. And money from garage sales, among others. That's right. The Washington Post based its estimate on a Bureau of Labor Statistics survey which represents the portion of workers who consider themselves independent contractors for their main job. Now the key phrase here is main job. As already mentioned, we lack a standard definition, but we also lack data. That's correct. Now, gig worker definitions will vary across studies, but the clear and consistent piece is that these workers are considered self-employed in some way. If we look at Schedule C data from federal tax returns, that can provide some historical context. You can see here that Schedule C filer's share of total employed persons has increased from around 13% back in 2000 to nearly 17% in 2015. Other researchers have used the current population survey, or the CPS, 
as a proxy for uh, gig workers. Now, the self-employment definition is well established and has been used for years. Technically, this larger group of self-employed folks share the same potential exposures to workers' comp leakage as gig workers. But when we look at the CPS data, shown here as a green line, what we see is that over the same time period, a decrease from around 7.5% to approximately 6.5%. So these two series highlight why there are such differing opinions out there, not just in terms of the size of the gig economy, but also in terms of which direction it's trending. But the green line at the bottom captures only the main job. So secondary employment is missed. This suggests that self-employment growth is mostly due to secondary jobs. Right, so when someone drives a few hours for Uber or Lyft, the payroll from their main job is still in the system, so we don't get so much exposure leakage, per se. Now, for the economic impact, we looked at taxable earnings under Medicare. Some of that is from wages and salary, and some is from self-employment. Two takeaways. First, looking at the counts. That's the orange line at the top. The percentage of workers with taxable self-employment earnings is growing. Now, when you look at the aqua line at the bottom, you see the number of dollars, and there the percentage of taxable earnings is essentially flat. Now, last year, the Supreme Court of California issued the Dynamex ruling, which makes it harder to classify a worker as an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. Now, this new definition doesn't just impact gig workers, but it could also lead to the reclassification of workers who have been independent contractors long before anyone was even talking about a gig economy. Now, if the Dynamax decision is adopted in more states, we could see a meaningful portion of self-employed earnings move into the uh, wages and salaries category. And what that means is increased exposure under workers' compensation and potentially some underwriting challenges. On the other end of the spectrum, five states have enacted legislation saying that when someone performs work through an online platform, that individual is an independent contractor. And about two weeks ago, the U.S. Department of Labor actually issued a letter which essentially says the same thing. This separates gig workers from the traditional independent contractors. And remember, gig work isn't limited to just the transportation platforms like Uber and Lyft. It transcends a lot of industries like travel and handyman work, even the medical field, which brings us to our next topic. And that would be telehealth and wearables. We decided to combine the telehealth and wearables discussion today because of the similarities in both the technology and the usage potential. So I know everyone's anxious to hear the poll results, so we'll start there. 30% see telehealth as a potential game changer, and for wearables, another 30% of respondents feel that it's a potential game changer. A little lower than I expected. When we talk about telehealth, we mean the use of electronic communication technologies. This could be between two physicians, but most typically it's between a patient and a healthcare provider who are in different locations. For example, imagine a video conference for a patient who lives in Eastern Kentucky being examined by a physician in Chicago or New York. Yeah, another example could be a local practitioner that's receiving vital signs or other health data through a remote patient monitoring or RPM device. RPM. Now, to date, telemedicine hasn't been used on a wide scale, especially in workers' comp. And this is largely due to the legislative and regulatory restrictions that exist. For example, the patient must live in a rural area, and the patient must be in a medical facility with a non-treating physician on site, not to mention technology, privacy concerns, and other issues. Now, once we get past these regulatory constraints or hurdles, Missouri Senate Bill 579, which passed back in June of 2016, has shown us that the growth of telehealth use in workers' comp can grow very rapidly. In a matter of two years, we saw a ninefold growth even though it started from practically nothing. 
Other states are in the process of putting in some regulations for telehealth. If current restrictions are addressed and telehealth and wearables use becomes more widespread, the benefits could indeed be fascinating. Currently, when a worker gets injured, it could be at an office building, a factory, construction site, it really doesn't matter. But what happens often is that the worker seeks care at the emergency room. But in the future where remote patient monitoring devices, RPMs, are commonly used, well, in some cases, those injuries will still go to an emergency room. However, our medical call data shows that 64% of ER visits are not in the life-threatening or high-severity injury categories. Now, a medical expert could remotely triage the injured workers, possibly with an aid of an RPM or wearable. Right. The injured worker would still be directed to the emergency room where appropriate. Let's not forget that. But the less serious cases could be treated by a doctor, either remotely or in person. So to derive the potential savings, we considered what would happen if these cases were treated at a doctor's office instead of the emergency room. For these less serious injuries, the average ER visit costs roughly $900 in work comp, and about two-thirds of that cost is for the facility. Mm -hmm. Now, on average, the longer evaluation and management visits uh, at a doctor's office only cost around $270. So based on these figures, the savings potential for ER visits is 20% to 30%. And since ER visits make up almost 10% of workers' comp medical costs, this equates to a 2 to 3% savings on total medical. Now, let's keep in mind that these changes are not instantaneous, but rather changes that, like the AVs, could become more prevalent over the course of time. Consider another situation where an injured worker is recovering at home. Without the hassle of traveling to a doctor, there would be fewer missed appointments, and one doesn't have to deal with the traffic on the 95, right? Roger but doesn't like traffic in case you At know. all. Uh, but more importantly, we would achieve greater adherence to the treatment plans. Now, between appointments, the patient's health could be monitored remotely. And this um, remote monitoring would allow for earlier detection of adverse de developments in a patient's health, and it would thwart major setbacks before they occur. Currently, the average hospitalization episode in work comp costs around $35,000. And in 8% of the cases, the patient is readmitted within 30 days, also at an average cost of $35,000. Several studies on the effectiveness of remote patient monitoring programs have shown important consequences of adopting telehealth on hospital readmissions. A 75% decrease in the 30-day hospital readmission rate, a 50% decline in the average length of stay, and a 50% reduction in the number of patients requiring uh, hospitalization. So if we assume similar savings are possible for workers' comp, we have the potential savings of up to 2% on medical costs. And we have the potential use of remote patient monitoring devices for physical therapy. As we saw in Barry's presentation yesterday, physical therapy is an important and sizable part of the treatment of injured workers. PT consists of evaluation, manual therapy, uh, massages, stretching, and so on. Along with exercises and activities shown here in purple. This includes repeatable routines for strengthening, improving flexibility, and so on. And this bucket accounts for 60% of physical therapy costs. On average, there are about 15 exercise and activity sessions for physical therapy claims in workers' compensation every year. Some of these will continue to take place with a therapist, mm -hmm. but then in some other situations, wearables and RPMs would allow some of these sessions to be performed without a therapist at a convenient location. This once again would improve the adherence to the treatment plan.
Now, if RPM devices were to allow 25 to 75 percent of these sessions to be shifted from being done with a therapist to without a therapist, the savings potential for medical would be in the 2 percent to 5 percent range. Today, wearables gather much of the same information as remote patient monitoring devices. Wearable technology is still in its infancy, but in the future, the measurement using wearables could become as precise as those of RPMs. And while RPMs come into play after an injury, wearables can be used at any time. Now, widespread use of wearables in the future could lead to significant injury prevention. Imagine a wearable that would beep or vibrate to warn of potential risks. It could be an approaching forklift or imagine adverse weather for workers on a high-rise construction site. Yeah, wearables could also alert managers and coworkers immediately after an injury takes place and therefore medical attention can take place at once. And many employers offer light duty to get claimants back to work more gradually. Mm -hmm. A wearable could track things like repetitive motion or the weight of objects being lifted and then alert both the worker and management if he's exceeded his work restrictions. The world of medicine, the needs of our aging population, and medical delivery systems are ever evolving. We have seen some very dramatic technological advances that make for new and perhaps more effective ways of delivering care to the injured workers without a universal healthcare system in place. Yeah, the cost of healthcare in the United States is significant. Uh, the uh, national expenditure has exceeded the $3.5 trillion mark, and it's hovering right around 18% of gross domestic product. Now, the concern remains, and in the political arena, there's no shortage of proposals for universal healthcare. In 2019, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation poll, popular support for single-payer health insurance was upward of 56%. Recently, the Health Affairs analyzed the campaign platforms, built co-sponsorship records, and public statements made by uh, newly elected members of Congress. And they found that the number of representatives supporting Medicare for All has risen to over 133. Okay, so popular support's growing, but is it a game changer? Let's see what our audience thinks, Raji. 30% of respondents see UHC as a potential game changer. Now, if we were to have a universal healthcare or UHC system in the US, it's hard to imagine, quite honestly, that it wouldn't be a game changer for work comp. Mm -hmm. It's also hard to imagine just how complicated a change like this would be to get implemented and how long it would take to implement. Now, keep in mind here that we're looking at hypothetical scenarios some 15 years out into the future, and we're going to examine potential effects that such a change might have on our work comp system. Currently in the United States, medical benefits make up almost 60% of total workers' compensation benefit costs, with some variation across states. If medical services should altogether be covered by some kind of a national or universal medical benefit plan, that would be a most radical change to our workers' comp environment as we know it today, losing the key focus on return to work. To be clear, we're not advocating for any type of system, but merely considering the potential impacts on workers' compensation should a universal healthcare system be put in place. Well, Raji, for our neighbors to the north, um, medical and work comp is only 25% of benefit costs. Now, the medical share is lower in Canada because of lower healthcare costs, but also higher indemnity costs. And details will vary by province, but an example of the higher indemnity that Raji's referring to is that cost of living adjustments apply to most types of awards in Ontario. There are many different models of universal health care. Let's imagine for a moment that the Ontario model was used here in the United States, with many thanks to the folks at the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board of Ontario for sharing with us details about the workings of their system. For general healthcare, we would have a single-payer system with 
private providers, and some cost sharing. And under such a model, one could assume that universal health care or UHC reimbursement would be based on Medicare rates, and that for work comp, the medical would continue to be covered by private insurers, and that those insurers would pay a premium rate above UHC prices. Now, this could help preserve the return to work focus that's critical in work comp today. Under the, the plan and without group health as the benchmark for workers' compensation prices, workers' comp could potentially pay lower medical prices for the medical services. In fact, virtually all workers' compensation benefits would be impacted by this change. As Barry mentioned yesterday, now currently in the United States, group health insurance largely defines the marketplace of medical services and pays a premium above Medicare. Work comp on average pays more than group health to ensure rapid services, but also to compensate for the administrative burden. Under the hypothetical single payer scenario, workers comp would have to be based on a UHC level prices rather than group health. Well, our medical call shows that for every $100 paid under Medicare for physician services, mm -hmm. work comp pays $167 for those same physician services. Right. And as Barry shared yesterday, NCCI research has found a 12% premium over group health for the physician services. So the question is, what price would an insurer pay for the same services under the hypothetical Ontario model for work comp? Under universal health care, there could be a greater incentive to bundle care and reimburse providers based on overall patient outcomes rather than for the individual services performed. And the Ontario board uh, mentioned that they've made some use of that. There was plenty of talk yesterday at the physician's uh, session about uh, value-based care. So let's take a look at what one example, and that's a pilot program here in the United States that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid started, and that's that of the accountable care organizations. It reimbursed providers for integrated treatment based on patient outcomes, a practice referred to as value-based care. Now, preliminary results have shown that ACOs have resulted in modest savings to the order of 2%, perhaps. CMS is currently transitioning ACO participants to a more rigorous program of uh, monitoring value-based care. Now, here again, we can see how some of the changes that could result from a game changer come in steps and possibly over time. If work comp insurers could leverage the streamlined value-based care payment model, the system could see savings perhaps as much as 5% of medical costs. Now, the Affordable Care Act did deliver several of these newer models for uh, payment. We also saw a dramatic growth in high deductible health plans. Today, some Americans do not have sufficient health insurance. To be fair, this is usually because deductibles and other cost-sharing measures right now are high in a lot of health plans. Correct. So for some, this can mean that using their own health insurance may not, be, may not seem like an option at times. The alternative is perhaps for a worker to claim injury under workers' compensation. This causes shifting of claims from group health to workers' compensation. A recent study from WCRI has found that high deductible plans could result in increased workers' compensation claim frequency. Universal health care may eliminate some of the cost sharing in health insurance, so an injured worker could feel free to claim their injury under either insurance system without worrying about his personal financial impact. The more that UHC eliminates out-of-pocket costs, the smaller the incentive will be for claim shifting. So healthcare is certainly complex, and universal healthcare proposals even more so. As we heard yesterday from Dr. Dietz, we currently face a future shortage of physicians. How a universal healthcare system would impact such shortage is an important question for the health of our nation and for workers' compensation. Currently, employers pay about 10% of workers' wages for group health insurance on average. 
exactly how a UHC plan would be financed is an area of great importance and would require careful examination. What else, Sean? A couple things come to mind. Um, employment in the healthcare sector and also for group health insurers mm -hmm. would be significantly impacted. And it's also not clear exactly what role uh, group health insurers would play under such a model. And then you'd have to imagine also that self-employment would possibly become more prevalent because there would be this UHC safety net for the medical needs. So putting it all together, many models of universal healthcare proposals are being put forth both at the state level and nationally. One thing's for sure, the wheels of change are turning and today we have shared some of the gears of our dynamic world that are already set in motion. We started out with autonomous vehicles. They're already here and their technology will undoubtedly impact work comp. We showed potential savings from their safety features, which would of course depend on how prevalent they are in our daily lives. But when we consider the new safety features, and I'm sure there are more to come, a 75% reduction in motor vehicle accidents from autonomous vehicles doesn't really seem far-fetched, and that could yield some $4 billion of savings to the work comp system. The gig economy is certainly a contributor to our overall productivity, but largely as a secondary source of income. For now, it may not be as much of a game changer as we had originally thought. Telehealth and wearables are very much the talk of the town in work comp circles, and for good reason. There's such a great potential for immediate applicability to the delivery of medical services, which alone could reap in some $1 billion to $3 billion worth of savings. Furthermore, the emerging technology and its application to loss prevention, while not mature enough for an immediate impact, on its face seems promising. And the most significant of the potential game changers discussed today is the option of universal health care. A complete elimination of medical from workers' compensation would have an alarming consequence to the industry and potentially to injured workers, as the focus on return to work would be inherently threatened. Of the many models out there, we looked at an Ontario example as one option that would essentially preserve the basic elements of the workers' compensation system as we know it. We have shared some insights on the potential impacts of significant game changers. Thank you all for your attention today, and stay tuned for future game changers in the dynamic world of workers' compensation. Raji and I will be right here at the front of the stage to answer any questions that you have. This brings us to the end of our session and the end of AIS 2019. See you all in 2020.